Welcome everyone for our session. We're going to talk about remote control planes and, and how to build those or construct them with, with a component called connectivity. And of course, we'll start with uh, what it is and why would you do something like this? And, and, and then we'll focus a bit also on the, the sort of building blocks that, that how to do, how to do things. So I'm Jussi from Mirantis, working mostly with the, our K0's Cube Distro. Hi, my name is Maud Kazem, and I am uh, working by Kubernetes, and uh, mainly working on cluster provisioning, cluster networking, and lifecycle. Glad to be here. All right. So as said, the, the kind of outline for our session is, is focusing first on what we actually mean when we talk about a concept called remote, remote control plane. Uh, we'll have a look at a couple of uh, different use cases. Where would you actually want to do something like this? And then what are the building blocks and, and concepts in, in, in Kubernetes and, and in other components that you can actually actually kind of pull this off in a way. And of course, we'll, we'll have a bit of, bit of kind of a history lesson too that, that what, what has been there and what, what, what is there now in Kubernetes. And a couple of real world integration examples on, on, on this. Uh, of course, as always, we're standing on shoulders of giants here, so uh, we're us, us two, we're not really the sort of inventors of, of, of this stuff. Uh, merely like, more like happy users of, of what, what the community is, is building. Uh, why we wanted to have this sort of a talk is, is uh, the main thing is that, that there's very, very little documentation and knowledge on this topic. So we want to raise the awareness that, that, okay, you can actually do something like this. Whether it makes sense for you, your use case or not, that's, that's a different discussion. So basically kudos to the, all the original inventors and, and people that have been working on the different caps in the, in the past and to, to make this actually happen. All right. Okay, so um, as what you see already spoke about, we're, gonna, we're not gonna dive into the whole um, technical backgrounds of how we achieve things. So usually a Kubernetes cluster just looks like this. You have a master control plane component, it's a node, and you have other worker nodes as well. Where you have, you know, your API server or the whole control plane components deployed uh, on the same node and then your worker nodes just keep talking with that guy. Now this was working, still working. It has you know, as what we say, we have a bi-directional connection between the worker nodes and the control plane nodes. It's unrestricted, so they can speak smoothly one another, whether that's, you know, a requirement or not. It's fast, since, again, there is no a lot of restriction in there. Reliable, of course, and secure. And um, often node local or, you know, you have, they are on the same layer two networking probably and yeah, nice, things are working, everything is okay. Uh, it's in the other direction. Ah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what's really this whole fuzz is all about, about remote uh, Kubernetes control plane, where you have the, um, the control plane components being running on a completely different um, probably data center or a different node out of that subnet. And use, and, and those are quite hard to tweak and play with. It's really not that easy to have your ping pong connection going through your worker nodes and the master node or the control plane components. Um, it, you need a lot of moderation, a lot of configuration, a lot of tweaking. And with that, we have quite a few challenges, such as probably one direction, since you have, you know, uh, you will have some NAT going between your control plane components and the worker nodes. It could be very restricted because, again, you might be hooking into a different network. So there should be, or I assume there should be some firewall rules and uh, whatever load balancers that you're speaking with. So it's not that easy to have 
kind of uh, a smooth connection in there. Slow, of course, latency, as we said, could be on a different data center, different subnet, could be here in the US and your work nodes are in Europe. Not sure if that's a wise idea, but who knows? Yeah, hashtag itch. So um, less reliable, of course, again, network partitioning could happen between your worker and uh, your master node. Probably insecure because there are a lot of plumbing between your worker nodes and your master node or your control plane nodes component. And of course, that everybody don't like, I hope that don't like, that there is a possibility that you're doing things over the internet. And if not, probably gonna do a lot of, you know, tunneling into that guy. Exactly. So what kind of use cases that we are looking here at where you would like to go for a remote cluster instead of just being a very happy user with these local clusters I spoke about in the beginning? So to begin with, you have, of course, this, um, uh, the, the trust or, so to say, the, um, the uh, segmentation where you have like the control plane components being on a different data zone or a different data center where your worker nodes are. Next, we have also like, of course, you need to do a lot of configuration and plumbing. And uh, this could be actually also something that, uh, you know, where you isolate your control plane components away from your worker nodes. So whatever happens there, you're still safe in a way. It is also human error, I mean, less human error because usually when you have those control plane components being somewhere else, then you were, your real work is being carried out on your worker nodes. Probably a human wouldn't be, or users, in other words, normal users, wouldn't be able or shouldn't be able to get access on your main components or control plane components that easily. In addition to that, you have also, as I mentioned earlier, the Kubernetes edge use cases where your workloads or apps that you are running is on a very, very remote cluster, meaning that it could be in someone else's house or in someone else's, I don't know, garage, car, you name it. And of course, the last but not least is hybrid cloud. The thing that, you know, hopefully everybody is now aware of, <laughs> you know, where you might have some connections to the cloud providers, but still you have some kind of somewhere dark where you still run your physical data centers and uh, you like to achieve this kind of hybrid model where you have, you know, things are on multi-cloud and other things on your data centers. That gives you a lot of flexibility. And this is exactly what we are looking at in this uh, image here. What we see here, as you can see, on the left side, you have your control plane components being deployed somewhere. And your workloads are completely isolated, could be running really far away from where those control planes are. And uh, they could be even like co-located, me meaning that you could have one node or one cluster where your control plane components for different clusters are being in the same place. Of course, you should have then, you should take care of namespace isolation, things like that. And for you, you could, if you are building a multi-tenancy application here and you would like to get, get a grip on your uh, control plane components, of course, and clusters, you could come up with a very nice architecture where you can uh, operate and run hundreds or even thousands based on how your initial architecture scales. Of course, with that, you have HA because eventually what you have on that isolated thing, it's your game, it's your playground as a service provider. So you can really um, scale up, scale down based on the demands that you have. And of course, you have the very same control plane experience across multiple clusters, meaning that there's not too much um, context is being given to one cluster to another. You treat every single control plane as, you know, as the same and you leave whatever that's have to run on these clusters for the users. And of course, if you have, you need some orchestrations for these, uh, for these control plane components. And if they are existing in the same place and you have your controllers, for example, in one place, you could easily operate in that without any, I hope, slowness or latency because you're probably speaking to the same um, uh, edge, to the same uh, endpoints. Of course, could be like more, a lot of specifications into that. And eventually, yeah. It's uh, Kubernetes as a service. It's just, you know, you don't need to let your users think a lot about the control planes, think a lot about the Kubernetes is not that easy. I mean, probably you know that already. Networking is not that easy. <laughs> so um, 
you need to try to you know, surround these bottlenecks and these obstacles as much as you can. Otherwise, yeah, have fun. All right, back to UC. All right, thanks. Well, so, <clears throat> why, is, why is all this like, like a challenge? I can run my API server, schedulers, all the control plane components, I can run it on one box. And then I can have a worker that connects to the API, right? What's the, what's the challenge there? So the API server actually has to talk to the in-cluster components in, in many different use cases. So when you want to do something like kubectl, logs, XYZ, the API actually calls to the kubelet, which then talks to the container runtime. So API needs to be able to talk to the kubelet. But remember in previous pictures, we had some NAT layers or firewalls in between, so API just cannot do that in those, those circumstances. Uh, there's a few different use cases where API server expects to be able to actually communicate with the cluster network too, like service IPs, pod IPs. So when you do kubectl proxy, the API actually takes a proxy connection to the pod or service IP. Admission controllers, which API expects to be able to call with webhooks, which are on the cluster network. So it's really this, this kind of uh, from the API to the cluster communication that is the main challenge with these room, remote control planes. It, it's, it's not the part where you run the control plane itself. That's super easy. Or well, it's still Kubernetes, so it's easy-ish. Relative. <laughs> so looking back in time, which is always fun, uh, there actually was something for this specific use case built in into the API server in, in, the, in the past. Uh, so the API server actually supported a thing called SSH tunnels in the past, but that was deprecated on, on version 1.9 for various reasons. Uh, and after that, the, the, there's been people like us, for example, building the same or, or similar capabilities using various different custom solutions like open VPN tunnels or some other, other networking mm, gimmicks, let's put it that way. Uh, but then luckily there's, there, there was, as, as I mentioned, we're standing on, on shoulders of giants here. So uh, there was this KEP 1281 was born in spring 2019. And that's really the, the, the kind of foundation on the, on the actual solution and the kind of architecture building blocks that we can utilize nowadays to, to, to kind of punch through the firewalls and, and network segments and, and all that stuff. So basically the, the CAP 1281 lays out the, the architectural components and concepts how we can actually route this API server to cluster calls and, and different use cases via something that actually makes it, makes it work in these use cases. So one of the concepts in, in that cap is, is uh, defining a concept of egress selector on the API server. So it's essentially a config flag plus of course, YAML. So basically this, this egress selector on the API server side acts as, as, as sort of a routing mechanism that, that uh, when the API server in these different use cases wants to talk to, to the cluster or to some other external components, how do we route that call that it actually can reach the cluster, whether it's a pod or whether it's kubelet or whatever it is. The, as, as you see in the, in the YAML config example, you usually have something 
the, the routing, the proxying component, running kind of as a sidecar-ish setup for the APS server. So the APS server actually talks to a local Unix socket, and then there's something behind that Unix socket that then routes the, the call towards the cluster. There's various different types that you can configure for the egress, egress selection. So when you're having a type called cluster, we mean when APS, APS server wants to talk to pods, wants to get logs from kubelets, when you do proxy stuff and, and, and those sort of use cases. Uh, etcd, well, that's kind of obvious. When API wants to talk to etcd, you can actually route that even through this extra selection mechanism. And then for the control plane, you can configure how the API talks to admission hook, web hooks and, and uh, admission controllers and, and all that stuff. So essentially, like our title says, it's connectivity. So connectivity component is, is kind of born through that cap. So the cap is, is like, like many other caps in, 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 in Kubernetes. It's, it's kind of laying the architectural foundations, defining the interfaces, how things work. And, and, and it's, it's really the same here too. So the egress selection and, and how the API talks to the, the Unix socket, that's like the interface. You can have basically anything behind it. But connectivity is one of the SIG projects, which is kind of the, sort of like the reference implementation for this whole thing. As far as I know, it's actually the only implementation, but, but, but still. And I wouldn't want to write one on my own because it's, it's actually quite complex if you, if you look, at the, look at the whole thing. All right. So how does it actually work? And how do we punch through the firewalls and NAT layers? So in this case, when we use connectivity, so it's divided to uh, two different components, a connectivity server and connectivity agent. So the connectivity server is, is acting kind of like the routing logic, kind of as a sidekick to the API server. So the agent is running within the cluster on the worker nodes, whether it's a daemon set, whether you run it as a deployment, there's options. And, and the agent actually opens up a connection to the connectivity server. So now we have a gRPC tunnel that we can use. Now when the API wants to talk to, say, kubelet to get logs of a pod, API server talks to the local Unix socket. And behind that socket, we have the connectivity server. And now the connectivity server knows that, okay, I have this agent connected to me, and they have an open gRPC tunnel. So we actually use that tunnel to call to the agent, basically saying that, that hey, we want to get logs from this specific kubelet. Or, well, it doesn't actually say anything about logs, but it basically says that we want to connect to this specific kubelet on this IP address. So, in a nutshell, it's pretty much like SSH reverse tunnels. I bet many of you have used those in the past to do fancy tricks. And all of this is, is, is going on top of gRPC. So it's secure because it's on top of TLS, of course. And it's actually, my, in, in my first impressions, it, it was actually even quite fast. I mean, I, I, I was thinking that, okay, when we built this, it's reverse tunnels on top of TLS, on top of gRPC. Oh God, it must be slow as hell. But actually it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty slick. All right, some real world 
examples. All right. So, as you could have, as you have already seen, what uh, you showed, the uh, the stack is quite interesting for the whole networking. With that, at Kubernetes, we leverage how connectivity do things, and what you see over here is a true multi-tenant architecture that we run every day, where you have those on the, on the right side, these blue boxes that has user clusters, those are simply a Kubernetes clusters that only run node applications, so workloads. Not on any of these um, uh, clusters, there will be no node that's being marked as a master node, no. All of them, if you end up with a three node cluster and you do the usual kubectl git node, you will only see three node clusters and none of them is actually marked as master because none of them are master. What we do instead is, on the left side, we have these seed clusters, we call them, and there, in that specific Kubernetes cluster, we compact and co-locate co -locate the control pane components namespaced with all what you need. It is completely isolated from what the user, the regular user is seeing. There is no way that they could, you know, communicate and see what's going on in that control plane namespace because it's already on a different clusters and of course there are a lot of, you know, um, uh, RBAC rules, for example, you have a lot of uh, network um, isolation. So it's not really easy if you get up, if, if, you, if you end up with a Kubernetes or kubeconfig for the Kubernetes cluster on the right side, for you, you won't be able even to see how these control plane, how, how these uh, pods for the, for the control plane components pods, for example, looks like. They're not there. You only see what it matters to you. It only, you only see your applications, your workload. And this is exactly what we are doing and how we are leveraging connectivity. On the left side, on the seed cluster, we actually inject the, um, uh, I mean, the API, um, the, like alongside the API server, the uh, connectivity agent. And there is a connectivity agent running on the left, uh, on the right side, on the user cluster side. What happens then when you create a cluster? The, we have some certain controllers that take care of the control plane are in place now. All the components are now ready. And then we spawn the machines. Machines gets, worker machines only gets what they need. And then user connectivity, the agent, for example, receives um, a request. It finds the right one, as what you already mentioned. And then the, the connection between Kubelet on the right side and the API server on the left side will be there. And what is quite interesting about this, you don't have to run the, the connectivity agent on each node. These, these nodes, they would know each other, they're observant about each other, and they can, they can forward the, uh, the traffic or route it, I mean, from one node to another very actively, and a lot of observability is being induced. So this is exactly how our, so to say, multi-tenant slash co-location for the control plane components work. Again, right side, user clusters or clusters in general, those are Kubernetes clusters, there are no control plane relation. There is like they're not there when you try to list them. And this is a very, very real world scenario. As, as what Jose already mentioned, like we, in the past, we only had to fiddle a lot with a lot of different applications, for example, OpenVPN server, where you needed to, yeah, manage this, manage that, and uh, run an OpenVPN client on the right side. It was like a whole mess for us. For us, we really wanted just to have a reliable connection between the API server or between the control plane components and the worker nodes and call it a day. It should be, of course, reliable, secure, fast, and this is what we experienced so far with connectivity, and that's why we like it. On the left side, as you can see also, it's not, you will see a lot of containers, like 35 containers that were only there for connectivity, that's all. You need these containers to have connections between your worker nodes and the control plane components, which was too much for us. And on the like left side down, you, you look like, you, you see the, um, the OpenVPN client that eventually will connect. And if you, I mean, OpenVPN server, that's, yeah, OpenVPN is nice, but if you do it on that scale, very automated, sometimes it could be really hard to, be, to debug and know what's going on. Of course, never to mention the, a lot of IB tables rules that we have to introduce to make that. On the right side, you see the happy path where we use connectivity. 
we have one connectivity um, injected into our control plane component part up uh, on, uh, on top. And on the lower part, you already see that, yeah, we have only like two agents, two pods. Those are no daemon sets. They don't have to run on each node. So you don't have to worry about having like hundreds of nodes and taking care of agents being running on each one of those. This is not the case here. And all that done beautifully, like the connectivity that you have between your API server or control plane components in general and your worker node is being smooth and secure as possible. Back to All right, and, and there's a lot of similarities, of course. What I've been working on is, is the case of distro. And, and in our case, we really build connectivity into the picture from day one. And, and for us, the, one of the main driving use cases actually was not this like, like network segregation or anything, but the fact that who are who can deploy stuff on master nodes? So if you, if you take your traditional cube ADM setup cluster where you have actual master nodes and worker nodes, how do you control if Joe can deploy stuff on master nodes? There's no RBAC for that. Yeah, of course you can throw in some OPA gatekeepers, whatnot, but, but should you have to do that? In my opinion, no. So that's why we landed, landed on, on having connectivity in the picture and, and, and sort of as, as an added bonus, we got the ability to have this real network segregation and that really, really enables some super, super interesting deployment scenarios where you run your control plane in a location X and then the workers are somewhere deep down in your bunker and it's enough that, that they just can call out to the control plane and everything works as, as in your traditional cube ADM cluster. That's super cool. We actually managed the, the, the agents as a daemon set to have also high availability for the connections. Well, of course, there's no solutions without challenges. So. Uh, as I mentioned, and, and why we're actually giving this talk is, is lack of documentation and that lack of general knowledge that, that you can actually do something like this. The HA setup for the connectivity server and agents is actually a bit tricky. How they, how they, if you have multiple agents and multiple servers, each agent has to have a connection to many servers, of course, otherwise it's not, it's not HA. So it's like M times N issue. So that's a bit of a tricky topic. Debugging things is a bit hard because there's something in between the call now. So you can't do like, like TCP dump at least that easily on, on, on things. And then when the connection tunnels are not working as, as expected and you do something like kubectl logs, the errors that you see on your CLI are super, super weird. You're not gonna able to figure out that it, it's actually somewhere in connectivity unless you've seen those errors too many times as I have. It's like shooting in the dark, so to say. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, we had those. Uh, and also what I'd encourage everyone who's interested in this, join the SIG that, that's maintaining this because there is a, a, a true lack of contributors. So we're trying to do, of course, our best, and, and, uh, but it takes time to land PRs and fixes and all that. So join in and help all of us. All right, there's a couple of minutes for questions and, and I guess we can hang around in the, in the hallway after the, after the talk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. <laughs> and is it possible to apply this principle to distribute the um, controllers uh, of the root cluster? I mean, in this scenario, the root cluster is the single point of failure. So can we use the connectivity to 
extend this, this idea also to the controllers. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, we can maybe quickly go back to the, uh, to the slide. I don't know if we can do this, but let's try. There. So what we have over there, the root, as we call the root cluster, this is actually a component that would keep things um, synced down, like from upstream to downstream to those seed clusters. So it's just, if you are not able to speak with the root cluster for some reason, maybe it's not available, I mean, eventually it's one cluster, as you already mentioned. The real active work, so the heavy lifters, isn't the, re the root clusters, are the seed clusters. So the seed cluster, this is where your control plane components are going to be co-located. Right? Usually how we treat those, you have like a seed cluster with, with multiple data centers across, I don't know, maybe multiple cloud providers as well. And then what happens is when, uh, when, you, when you lose access for the root clusters, because in general, when you access root clusters, you will be accessing then the seeds based on, of course, some, a lot of uh, authentication authorization. And if you lose access to that, you can just simply connect to that seed cluster because by the end of the day, it's a, seed, it's, it's a Kubernetes cluster that it has its own cube config, right? And then um, uh, instead of doing it you know, from upstream to downstream, you can just do it downstream, like right away, hook into it, and then see what's going on over there. So this is like the model that we kind of think makes sense for that. So starting with the open VPN implementation and looking towards the connectivity implementation, is there a migration path there that you were able to achieve or look at, or is it tear down the old clusters and the new ones just get connectivity? I think it's pretty much tear down and build again. Yeah. I mean, there's no, uh, there's no real kind of uh, Kubernetes or, or any configuration in the API server that, that you can say that, okay, you have an open VPN tunnel here, so you, you have to build it yourself, so. You have to rotate your machine at some point, yeah. sadly, but yeah. This is pretty awesome. Um, what are the strategies that are in place, or what are the thoughts on how to make this easier for dynamic environments? Things like API server pods changing, or yeah bouncing around and having new IPs that you need to configure with all the agents. Yeah. All right. So uh, that involves something kind of uh, sort of an external load balancer. I mean, external from Kubernetes point of view. So in, in normal case, you configure the agents to talk to a load balancer. And, and, and basically, the, the connectivity servers, you configure that, okay, there's three servers running. So what happens in the agents, and, and this is why I said that AJ is a bit tricky. So, so what happens in the agents is that they connect to the load balancer, and they take as many connections to the load balancers so that the load balancer does unique connections for the agent. So it's kind of like a, sort of like a brute forcing the, the AJ connections. Gotcha, okay. Uh, and then one other question. Is there plans to do this uh, bi-directionally as well? Yes. Things like going from the Kubernetes service inside the cluster? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What, uh, is that in plans or where is that as well? Uh, there's, an, there's an open, long-standing long open PR on, on, on doing the tunnel like, like so that the agent opens up the API port on the, on the worker node and then goes through the same tunnel. It's, it's in the works, but as, as mentioned, we all can help to make that land and help in testing it then. You too stuff. can help also. Actually, we have a question here. Okay, one, one last question. We yep. are running out of time, people is hungry. And I said, I can, I can hang out in the hallway if, if anyone has any more questions or wants to Thanks. Discuss. Actually, um, so first off, which, which SIG? Sorry? What you, which SIG would we engage with? It's a special interest group. Ah, SIG. it's a SIG called SIG API Server Proxy. Okay. Something, I, I should have had it on <laughs> And then the, the real question was, what, what breaks with this? Um, like things like service meshes and Submariner and other funky network stuff, does, does this still work or do I, do I limit myself by, by doing this? Uh, I don't think you're limiting yourself at all doing this. In, in what, what we've seen in, in K0's use case is what usually is, is broken is the HA connections. 
load balancer having wrong configuration to have sticky sessions or something and those sort of things, yeah. which are pain to debug. Yeah, same here. I mean, um, for us, as I said, you could like run hundreds or maybe, dep depends on your main infrastructure, eventually the underlay and overlay infrastructure scales. But mainly what we saw that um, the agent and the server of connectivity, they, they run smooth as long as they are satisfied with the resources. And I don't think that they need a lot of resources. As we said, like um, uh, some cases you really need to have, um, as, as what you say already said, a lot of redundancy, like daemon said running on all these nodes. In other cases you only need, uh, for example, one um, uh, deployment and you call it a day. And with that, as I said, like we are running this in production. So this is production. This is not yep. some kind of POC or demo. <laughs> yep. And so far, it has been working multiple clusters, multi-cloud slash bare metal. Yep. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And hope you learned something new. Thank you very much. <laughs>